Okay, so we're already on class 11. So today we're going to be starting um, talking about number theory. Um, and the stuff we do today will lead us well into modular arithmetic, which will start on Thursday and continue into Tuesday. Okay, so first a couple announcements. So the grades for the quiz will be released either later tonight or tomorrow. Um, I will say that scores were lower than quiz one, but not by a whole lot. Um, and I can post, let's, sh I can post the uh, distributions if people are interested. Um, homework five has been posted on the website and it'll follow a slightly different schedule um, because it just has so many questions um, and I couldn't think of a good way to like break it up um, just because uh, we're sort of start starting a new topic on the Tuesday instead of the previous Thursday. Um, I just said, let's just make it span two weeks. So there's no homework due this Friday. Instead, it will be due next Friday, but it is pretty long. Um, I think it has 12 or so questions, and I highly recommend you look at all of them at some point, okay? Um, you have sort of two weeks to take a look at it, and essentially all of it will be relevant for our quiz uh, next Thursday, okay? Um, question one on the homework, though, is a mid-semester feedback survey, so, uh, and it's completely anonymous, so please fill it out and be as detailed as you can be, okay? Because it'll just help me um, tune the course um, and change things uh, if you would prefer that, okay? Um, and I may also post some additional optional practice questions, um, but they won't be collected either. It'll sort of just be for your own practice. So any questions with what's happening logistically? Okay, so now we're gonna start talking about number theory as I just mentioned which we can formally define as the branch of math that deals with the properties and relationships of numbers, but more specifically, um, the positive integers, so the natural numbers. And oftentimes, we we'll also consider the idea of the number zero, so whole numbers. Um, but really, we're, we're talking about natural numbers and whole numbers, okay, and various properties and relationships between them, okay? So the things we'll talk about today are this idea of the division algorithm, um, what it means for one number to divide another, which is something we saw actually a couple weeks ago, the idea of a prime, the idea of the fundamental, fundamental theorem of arithmetic, and um, how to compute things like the greatest common divisor between two numbers and the lowest common multiple between two numbers. Okay, um, and then as I mentioned before, on Thursday and next Tuesday, we'll talk about modular arithmetic, and that will sort of end this part of the course, okay? Um, I highly recommend you look at chapter 3 for the textbook, 3.1, I just finished it earlier today, um, so it, it contains everything that we'll do today. Um, there are a few sections that are not complete, but the gist of it's there, and it will be completed by tonight, um, so I highly recommend you take a look. And the modular arithmetic section, so 3.2, 3.3, still a work in progress, but they will be done um, you know, as we get to them in the course. So 3.2 will probably be done for Thursday, and 3.3 will be done for next Tuesday. Okay? Any questions? Great. Okay, so the first thing we want to define is the division algorithm. Okay, so the division algorithm states that if n is any integer, okay, so notice it could be positive or negative. <clears throat> and d is a positive integer, then there exist unique other integers q and r such that n is equal to d times q plus r, okay? And these variables are assigned um, in a very particular way. We can say n, well, I'll get to n in just a second. We can say d is what we call a divisor. Okay, so maybe this term is familiar from before. q is a quotient, and r is a remainder, okay? And the term we use for n is what we call a dividend. Okay, so what we're saying is that if we want to represent the relationship between some dividend n and some divisor d, we can always write n as divisor times quotient plus remainder. Is that clear? Divisor times quotient plus remainder. And you'll, you'll, hear, me, you'll hear me say that a lot, and especially when we start talking about how to compute um, modular inverses. This idea will keep coming up. Okay, divisor times quotient plus remainder. Okay, so let's look at a few examples. 
So one, why don't we look at the division of, let's say, 23 by 5. Okay? So consider the division um, uh, N being 23 and D being 5. Okay, what's the relationship divisor times quotient plus remainder we could write then? Right, well, we can say N is equal to D times something plus something else. Is that clear? And we know this remainder at the end has to be strictly less than the divisor. So this remainder, and this is an idea you've probably seen before, has to either be 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. Is that clear? And what's the um, quotient in this case? Well, that's 4 plus 3. Is that clear? So here we'd say 4 is the quotient, 3 is the remainder. Okay? What we wouldn't say, like, why you can say this, like, it's possible to say this. This violates the idea that the remainder has to be less than the divisor. Right? Because here the divisor is 5, remainder is 8. So this is not something that we want to say. Right? We said Q and R are unique, so the representation we'd actually care about is this. 23 is equal to 5 times 4 plus 3. Also, n can be any integer, so we could also consider negative n. So why do we say consider n is negative 37, d is 8? Okay? Here we could say 37 is equal to 8 times something plus something that is less than 8. Is that clear? So what, what would I fill in the blanks to be? 8 times what plus what? Ideas? Yeah. Good. Negative 5 plus 3. Okay? What's important is that when we divide a negative integer by a divisor, there is still a positive remainder or non negative remainder. Is that clear? So you can say. Like, that's the important part here. Remainder The remainder when we divide negative 37 by 8 is 3. Right? We said the Q, the quotient, can be negative. It's just an integer. Right? The only things that are restricted to be um, non-negative are the dividend and the remainder. Yeah? Could it be up to So, it would be similar. It just depends on how you define it. And just for consistency, because they're supposed to be unique, we're saying D is non-negative and uh, R is also non-negative. Like another way to think about this could be 8 times negative 4 um, minus 5, for example. Right. But we want uh, the remainder to be positive in this case. Any questions with this? Okay, so given... Um, uh, a dividend and divisor, you should be able to write this relationship. Okay? Now, we want to talk about divisibility. And this is a concept that we've seen many times in these proofs that we've been doing. In the case where R is equal to zero, when we have divisor times quotient plus remainder, we can say D divides N, right? Which we represent by D vertical bar N. Okay? More formally, what we're saying is that if A is some natural number and B is some integer, um, oops, these should be reversed. Yeah, this should be integer and this should be natural number. Okay? There exists some C that I can multiply by A to get B. Okay? So, like, an example of this is saying um, 8 dividing 24 just tells us there exists some c such that 8 times c is equal to 24, where c is an integer. Is that true? Yeah, well, I can just have c is equal to 3. Okay? Um, but just as well, I could say 3 does not divide 22 because there does not exist some c such that 3c is equal to 22, where c is an integer. 
Is that clear? Right. 3 times 7 gives me 21. There's no integer I can multiply by 3 to get 22. Okay? Also, something to note, just as well, I could say 8 divides negative 24. Right? Because I can say 8 times negative 3 is 24. Right? C just has to be an integer. It doesn't necessarily have to be, oh, it should be negative here. C does not have to be positive. Is that clear? So we can say 8 divides negative 24. Any questions with this? Cool. This is something we've seen before. Now we'll talk about the idea of prime numbers. I mean, this is something you've probably seen before. We say some integer n greater than 1 is prime if and only if. Um, they should say if and only if. If and only if. It's only factors are 1 and itself. Right? If it has factors other than 1 in itself, it's composite. And we say 1 is neither prime nor composite. And we'll look at why we define that in just a second. Um, and the smallest few prime numbers that you're familiar with, you know, 2, 3, 5, 7, so on and so forth. Um, but it turns out that there are, only five, there, there are infinitely many prime numbers, and so there's no largest prime number. Okay? Um, and we'll look at proof of that in a couple slides. But there are infinitely many primes. Is everyone okay with this idea? Okay. And so now, a question we want to answer is, how can we determine if n is prime? Okay, so what we want to do is check all the numbers between 2 and n minus 1 and check to see if they divide n, right? And if any number, um, oops, sorry, this should be reversed. This should be false. This should be true. And, you know, we can go through and check 2, 3, 4, dot, 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 all the way until n minus 1. And if the remainder, when we divide any of those numbers, uh, divide n by any of those numbers is 0, then it cannot be prime, right? So for example, if we were to check is prime, I don't know, four, at some point we would check for um, modulo operation two, which we haven't formally defined yet, but what this means is just the remainder <laughs> So the remainder when you divide A by B, we'll get that four mod two is equal to zero, and then therefore it's not uh, prime, right? And so if we go through this entire loop and there is no number that um, divided n, we can say n is prime, okay? And this, this works perfectly well. But can you think of a way that we could optimize this? Like a way that we could maybe perhaps check less numbers? Okay, so I'll let you think about it um, amongst yourselves for a minute or two, and then we'll try and see if we can come up with a more optimized version of this. Okay, so does anyone have any ideas on how we could optimize this? Could we check less numbers? I think someone in the back had their hand up. No? Okay. Yeah. We can check up to the square root of n. Okay, so you're saying we can check up to the square root of n. Why is that? Because uh, if we have a number um, that we've seen in that process, the conjugate of the number is going to have to be passed at that point. So yeah. Good. And so the general idea is you only actually have to check up into square root of n because 
um, if n is a square, then it'll have n, uh, like for example, if we have n squared, n and n will both be factors. But otherwise, uh, one factor will always be smaller than the square root, and the other factor will always be bigger than the square root. So all we really need to do is check the factors that are less than or equal to the square root. Okay, and if none of them divide n, then there will be nothing that divides n. Okay, and so we can look at this a little more formally. Right, if n is not prime, we can find a and b such that n is a, b, and a and b not are, are not equal to 1 or n. And so we notice if that if both a and b are greater than the square root of n, then the product a times b will be greater than n. Right, so we know that one of them has to be less than or equal to the square root. So we only need to check the factors um, of the numbers between 2 and square root of n, check to see if all of them divide, uh, or if any of them divide n, and um, proceed like that. Again, that's a typo, that should be false, and that should be true. Yeah? Uh, wouldn't that implementation not actually check the square root of n? Yeah, it rounds down. Uh, right, like, what if we're checking 37, for example? We only need to check up until 6, because 7 would be greater. But if you're doing, like, 36, would you have to check? Uh, I guess that was, like, Right, yeah, it, all, it always accounts for it, right? If n is not a perfect square, it'll just round down, and we only want the rounded down version, the, the floor function. Okay. Does that make sense? I was just saying, like, because the range function will check on that number, right? So, uh, oh, sorry, I see what you're saying. Yeah. There, there should be a plus one here. Yeah, good catch. Yeah, good catch. And yeah, that's why we had n here, because we're only checking until n minus 1. Okay? And um, in this example, I've uh, used explicit Python code, but in other classes, a thing you'll get in the habit of doing is writing pseudocode. So like, implementation details like that don't really matter. It'll sort of just be like a half code, half English version of your algorithm. Okay? And we can also mix things like that into this course. Okay, but is everyone clear with this? So we only actually have to check up until the square root of n. Okay, and that saves many, many values. Any questions with that? Cool. And there's another um, question we might want to ask ourselves. How do we find all of the primes up until and including n? Okay, so for example, given 3, how do I you know, write a function that returns 2 and 3? Or given 20... How do I write a function that includes all of the primes that are less than or equal to 20? Okay? And the process is called the sieve of eratost. I don't know how to pronounce that, but uh, that's what it's called. Okay? And we'll go over the general idea right now. And then there's a cool animation that is both in the textbook and you should look at on Wikipedia um, that sort of explains how this is done. Okay? So we'll start out by, let's suppose I want to find f of 20. So it's not that important that I'm writing it as a grid, like the implementation just treats them as a list, but it's not important. Okay, so one is not going to be a prime. And so what I do is iteratively cross out each prime and multiples of it that I see. So the first number I see here is two, so I'm going to cross out two and all multiples of it, because none of them will be prime. So let me cross out two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty. Okay, so um, these will represent of two. Now I look at the next number I see in this list, and I want to cross it out and all multiples of it. What's the next number I see that's not crossed out? Three, right? So I'm going to cross out three and all multiples of it. Three, six is already crossed out, doesn't really matter. Um, nine, 12, 15, 18. Okay, now I look at the next number on the list and cross out all multiples of it. Okay? Um, well, 5 and all of its other multiples have actually already been crossed out. And why is that? Well, it's because 5 squared is greater than 20. But 4, um, well, four we wouldn't look at. Um, the largest prime whose square is less than 20 is 3. That means all multiples of 5 will have already been crossed out. And so now all the numbers that remain are just the primes that are um, less than or equal to 20. And I shouldn't have crossed out 2 and 3 as we went along. So um, let's just put this. Okay, so again, I shouldn't have crossed out two and three. But anyways, 
Everything that's crossed out is not a prime. So we read off all the not crossed off numbers. I'll get 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, which gives me all the primes of that range. Is the general idea sort of clear? I go in, cross out all multiples of 2, then all multiples of 3, then all multiples of 5, so on and so forth, until I've crossed out all multiples of the primes that are smaller and everything that's left is a prime. Okay? So why don't we look at a little animation of this? Okay. Okay, it's sort of already running, but you get the idea. So the red ones are the multiples of 2, green ones are multiples of 3. Make this a little bigger. Do the multiples of 5, multiples of 7. Um, and then we notice all of the primes remaining, um, like their multiples that would have been in the list are already crossed off. And so everything that remains is now uh, prime. And you can just read them off the list. Is that sort of clear? So we iteratively cross all the multiples of 2, multiples of 4, so on and so forth. Okay? And in the textbook and in the slides, actually, I've linked to this article. We won't talk too much about it. It's just more for your own enjoyment. Okay? And this is the kind of thing that, you know, maybe in classes like CS170 you would analyze, like um, the runtime analysis or some things like that of this. Is that clear? Okay, so it's sort of just for your own understanding. I would highly recommend looking at that. Okay, so now we'll move on to this idea of what's called the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Okay, so it states that any natural number n greater than 1 is either prime or can be written as a product of unique prime factors. Okay, so for example, we can say that 2520 can be written as 2 times 2 times 2 times 3 times 3 times 5 times 7. It can also be written as 5 times 7 times 3 times 2 times 3 times 2 times 2. Each of these is really the same thing, right? They're just uh, the same numbers, but a different rearrangement of the product. Okay? And so the standard way we would write this, and let's just make sure that, that looks okay. Yeah, it is. Is 2 cubed times 3 squared times 5 times 7. Okay, so the, the base is increasing order. But actually, that really doesn't matter that much. Okay, this is the standard way we'll represent a number in terms of its prime factors. Okay, and so what does the fundamental theorem of arithmetic state? It states that one, we can write 2520 as a product of primes. Okay, and two, that this prime factorization is unique. Okay, um, regardless of the order, any product of primes that equates to 2520 will be the product of three twos, two threes, one five, and one seven. Is that clear? So it states that this prime factorization exists and that it's unique. So any questions with this idea? Okay. And so, um, why don't we practice how to determine the prime factorization? You might have seen this before, um, let's say in high school, but there's a good chance that you haven't seen this. So let's walk through it. Okay. So what we want to do is write 19600 is, you know, two to the summit thing times 3 to the something times 5 to the something and so on and so forth. Okay? And so what I like to do is write 19600 and a, um, a vertical bar to the left of it. Okay? And so usually what you do is repeatedly divide by 2 until the result is no longer an integer. Then I start repeatedly dividing by 3 until that result is no longer an integer and so on and so forth. Okay? Maybe just as a smaller example, why don't we look at 48? Okay, I can divide it by 2, right? It's even, so the result is 24. I can divide that by 2, right? I get 12. I can divide that by 2 again, I'll get 6. I can divide that by 2 again, I get 3. Can I divide by three, uh, 2 again? No, right, because my current number is 3. So the next largest prime is 3. I divide by that, and I'm left with 1. Okay, and so now the prime factorization of 48 it's just what I get by multiplying all the numbers in the left column. So what this tells me is 48 is 2 to the 4 times 3. Okay? And so normally that's what we'll do. We'll repeatedly divide by 2, uh, and then until we can't anymore, then start dividing by 3, then 5, and so on and so forth. But there's a trick um, that we can use when a number ends in a 0, right? And what do you th think that trick is? When a number ends in a zero, what do we know it's a multiple of? Yeah. 
10, right? And so we know anytime you have a factor of 10, you'll have a factor of 2 and 5, right? So I can just say 2, 5, and that will give me 1960. Another 2 and 5, that will give me 196. Okay? So I've taken two 2s and two 5s out. Now I have 196. Uh, I believe I could take 2 out of that, which should give me, um, let's see, 98. Okay? can take 2 out of that again, which will give me 49. And I know 49 is 7 squared, so I'll just have 7, 7. Is that clear? And so now, let's uh, check the exponents. I should have 2 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, times 5 to the 1, 2, times 7 squared. Is that clear? Okay, so if you haven't seen this sort of technique before, um, a good way to practice is just come up with a number and see if you can prime factor it. And to know if you did it correctly, you can just multiply it on a calculator and see if it's right. Is that clear? Cool, so you'll need to know how to do this. Okay, and so as I mentioned before, the standard way we'd represent a number like um, 2520 would be as this, right? Three squared, uh, sorry, two cubed times three squared times five times seven. And so we can call this the canonical representation of numbers. Okay, so we can write any natural number that's greater than 1 as p1 to the exponent a1 times p2 to the exponent a2, um, so on and so forth, until pk to the exponent ak. Is that clear? And um, if we need to, we can set any of these exponents to be equal to 0. So for example, I could say, um, for example, 50 is equal to 2 um, to the 1 times 3 to the, zero, 3 to the 0 times 5 squared times 7 to the 0 times 11 to the 0 times whatever. If I needed to, and you'll see um, very shortly um, what the cases might be if I need to do that, um, I can just set all of these exponents to 0, and that's okay. Right? Usually what we care about is the representation when none of the exponents are 0, um, but... This, this works. Is that clear? We can set any of these exponents to zero. Any questions with this? Okay, and notice we're setting um, a sub i to be in the set of whole numbers. Okay? So it's zero or a positive integer. Okay? So now there's two things to talk about. So one is why isn't one prime okay and the reason we don't consider one to be prime is because for example if i want to write the prime factorization of 10 i could say one times two times five or one squared times two times five or one to the 100 times two times five and technically these would all be different representations because the set of exponents are all different okay and so to in order to ignore this mess um, we just say one is not prime. Now, it's not really the only reason, but it is a reason. So these representations okay and two um, what we can say is that Right now, we're only allowing these exponents to be whole numbers, okay? What if we allow the exponents to be negative numbers? Okay? What will it allow us to do if we allow these exponents to be negative numbers? So for example, here, like these exponents, 1 and 2, they have to be 0 or greater. What if instead we had like 2 to the negative 1 times 5 to the negative 2? Yeah? Would you be able to convert all real, all real numbers? Not all real numbers, all but all, what did you say? All positive Not quite. How would I create square root of 2 with that? Yeah? You can cover all rational, you can cover all positive rational numbers, right? Um, because a rational number is just an integer divided by an integer, right? And so 
if I do this, it'll allow me to create any number that looks like one integer divided by another. Can cover all positive um, rationals. Okay, so for example, why don't we consider 12 over 35? Okay, how can I determine this representation? Well, I can just prime factor the numerator and the denominator and just write it as 2 squared times 3 times 5 to the negative 1 times 7 to the negative 1. Is that clear? So if I let the exponents be negative, I can get two rational numbers as well, positive. Any questions? Cool. So here's a fun question that I actually had in a technical interview last semester. Um, try and determine the smallest number whose digits multiply to 10,000. Okay? Smallest number whose digits multiply to 10,000. So I'll give you a couple minutes to discuss that, and then we'll come back together. Okay, so does anyone have an answer? Let's write them on, on the screen. What are some answers we came up with? Yeah. So two, five, five, five. That? Okay, any other answers? Anything? Okay, so yeah, that is the correct answer. Um, and let's talk about how to get to that. Okay? And so, first, what we want to do is figure out what we have to multiply to get 10,000. Right? And so the first step is to prime factor it. And you can see that 10,000 is 10 to the 4, which is just 2 times 5 to the 4, which is 2 to the 4, 
and 5 to the 4. Okay? So the easiest possible answer that we could get is just 2, 2, 2, 2, 5, 5, 5, 5. Okay? And here we want to be greedy in the sense that we want the smaller numbers at the front and the bigger numbers at the back. Right? Because the numbers at the back are weighted less and the numbers at the front are weighted more. Right? So obviously this is smaller than 5, 5, 5, 5, 2, 2, 2, 2. That's clear, right? Okay? But the biggest factor in a number size is the number of digits, right? And so if we can minimize the number of digits, uh, we'll, be, we'll be golden, right? And so another thing we could do is combine the two pairs of twos into a four, right? And so then we could have the number four, four, five, 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 right? And can we combine any further there? No, because you multiply the two fours, you get 16, which is greater than nine. And the uh, four and the five, you get 20, which is also greater than nine, right? So when combining these digits, you want to make it such that the new combined uh, number is nine or smaller, right? Because it has to be a digit, right? So that doesn't quite work. And so notice, if you multiply a 2 by a 5, that'll give you 10, which is also not a digit. So um, we're stuck having to multiply within the 2s. So we could either change 2, 2, 2, 2 to 4, 4, but we could also change 2, 2, 2, 2 to 2, 8. Is that clear? You can multiply 3 of the 2s. Okay? And so now our digits that we're looking at are 2, 8, 5, 5, 5, and 5. And of course, what we want to do is put the smaller numbers in the beginning, larger ones at the back, right, to make the number as small as possible. And so putting those together, we sort of just sort them, 2, 5, 5, 5, 8. Is that clear? Okay, so a cool little problem that deals with prime factorization. Any questions with this? Cool. And so the next thing I want to look at is the proof that there are infinitely many prime numbers, okay? And um, this is something that I really want you to work on, um, like, you know, by yourself or amongst your peers, um, and we'll, we'll come back to it. All right, like, we'll take it, we'll take it up together. But really try and get this on your own, okay? And I'll give you a hint, you'll want to do this by proof by contradiction, okay? Okay, so I'll give you a couple minutes and try and prove that there are infinitely many prime numbers.
Okay, why don't, we, why don't we get to it? Okay, so I said we'll do this as a proof by contradiction. And so what will be the thing we start off by assuming? Right? That there are not infinitely many primes, <coughs> i.e. that there is only a finite number of primes. Okay, so why don't we say assume... And why don't we just list them out, okay? So let's just assume there's finitely many primes. And let's just say P1, P2, P3, dot, 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 PK minus 1, PK. And so we're assuming that every prime number that exists is in this list. Okay? How can we proceed from here? Any ideas? Okay, so it seems like people are trying to think of something, uh, like prove that there's a prime number that's bigger than one of these. Okay, and that's sort of along the right track. Okay, so why don't we consider Q, which we can set equal to the product of all of the existing primes, plus one. Okay, so we're multiplying all of the existing primes and adding one. Okay? And so now, there are two cases. Well, there's case one, Q is prime. And that would be a contradiction because clearly Q is not on this list because it's bigger than every single number in that list. Okay? Okay? But the other, more interesting case is when Q is not prime. And by the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, any number that's not prime, what does it have? Right, we can write it as the product of prime factors. Okay? So what we can say is there exists some P prime such that P prime divides Q, and of course P prime is prime. Is that clear? Well, if Q is not prime, it has to have some prime factor that's not equal to one or Q. Okay? And now what we're gonna show is that this P prime is not in the list. Okay, I now realize that P prime is a terrible name because we're also talking about primes. But why don't, we, why don't we change it to P star? Okay? And so the contradiction we're going to show is that P star is not in this list, P1 through PK, which you agree is a contradiction, right? Because we're saying this list contains every single prime, and we're going to show, well, P star is prime, but it's, also, but it's not in the list. So that's a contradiction. Okay? And so here's my claim. P star is not in the list, P1, P2, PK. Why not? Why can P star not be in that list? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so what explicitly does that mean? Okay, so your argument is that if it was in that list, the rest of the product will give you Q, but we're at, like, the plus one messes things up. Yeah. And yeah, you're along the right track. Okay, it's because of this plus one. Okay, and so what we'll say is, um, okay, just can, suppose P star is equal to one of the PI, where I is, you know, some number between one and K. Okay, so what I'm gonna show you is that, like, by contradiction, P star cannot be equal to one of the original um, PIs, okay? Is everyone good with what we have here? Because I sort of need a new slide. Okay. Well, so again, we suppose P star is one of these numbers. Okay. Well, now, remember, Q is equal to P1, P2, P3, dot, 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 PK minus 1, PK plus 1. And now we want to divide this by P star. Right? 
And so let's see what happens. We divide this by P star, this by P star, and this by P star. Okay? Well, if P star divides Q, the quotient of, P and, of Q and P star is some integer, right? Is that clear? If P star divides Q, the result when you divide Q by P star will be some integer, right? But also, if P star is equal to one of the PIs, the result when you divide this thing by P star will also be an integer. Okay, I should probably start, stop touching that. Um, is that clear? Right? What I'm showing to you is that P star cannot be in that list. And essentially we're doing another mini proof by contradiction. Okay, so let's say, assume that P star is in this list. Okay, and that it divides Q. Well, if it divides Q, then Q divided by P star has to be an integer. And again, if it's in that list, this quotient right here will also be an integer, right? So suppose P star was equal to P3, the P3s would just cancel out and the result would still be an integer. Pretend P star was equal to P100 and the P100 on the numerator and denominator would cancel out, that thing's an integer, okay? And so what this gives me is N1 is equal to N2 plus one over P star. Is that clear? And the only way for this to be possible is if P star is equal to what? One. Right? But one is not a prime. Is that clear? Only possible when P star is equal to one. But, P, um, but I should be saying one is not prime. And so remember, this is our like mini proof. Therefore, P star is not in P1, P2, PK. And then we can say, therefore, um, there exists a prime not in our list. Therefore, by contradiction, primes are infinite. Okay? And so let's recap what we did. We're doing this proof by contradiction. Our, and the thing we want to prove is that there are infinitely many primes. So um, the thing we assume to begin with is that there are only finitely many primes. We give them a label P1 through PK. And I said, create this new number Q, which is the product of all the primes plus one. And we have two cases with Q. Either Q is prime, which means it's a contradiction because it's a prime that's not in the list or Q is not prime. But if Q is not prime, we show that there has to exist this new number, P star, which is also prime, but not in the list. And that is also a contradiction because we're saying every single prime in the universe has to be in this list. But we found another prime that's not in the list because if it was in the list, it'd have to be equal to one, but one is not prime. Is that clear? So we found a contradiction. And so therefore, there is no possible finite list we can make of the set of primes. And so therefore, the set of primes is infinite. Right. And if it's infinite, there's no largest element. So any questions with this? And this proof is exactly replicated in the textbook as well. Okay, so if um, this went a little too quick, you can always take a look at it. Any questions with this? Great. And so now, I want to start transitioning to the idea of the GCD and the LCM. Okay? And so first, I want to look at multiplication using what we called before the canonical representation of integers. Okay? So suppose I have N1 is equal to, um, you know, P, the product of P1 through PK, but with A1, P1s, A2, P2s, so on and so forth. I think I refer to these as the multiplicities. Okay, if you've taken uh, uh, like VAT 54 or something or E16A, we'll talk about the multiplicity of an eigenvalue, right? Similar kind of thing. Um, and N2 is equal to the product using the same bases but different exponents. 
Okay? So I can say the product n1 times n2 is equal to the product with the same bases, but now the exponents are a1 plus b1, a2 plus b2, so on and so forth, until ak plus bk. And this is just a direct application of our exponent laws. Okay? So for example, let's prime factor 1200. Well, we have 2 squared and 5 squared. Right, that, gives it, that gets rid of the two twos, uh, the two zeros, sorry. And then 12 is 2 squared times 3. And so what that gives us is 2 to the 4 times 3 to the 1 times 5 squared. And usually we won't write 3 to the 1, but just to make it explicit. Okay? Then we'll look at 2520, which we can quickly prime factor. Okay, we get rid of the 2 and 5, which gives us 252. The 2 gives us 126. Um, that also is a multiple of 2, so that gives us 60. Three, and we know 63 is 9 times 7, right? Yeah, so that gives us 3, 3, and 7. Okay, so 25, 20, we can say is 2 cubed times 3 squared times 5 times 7. Okay, and so just for things to match up, I can write 7 to the exponent 0. Okay, it really doesn't change the product because anything to the 0 is 1, but just so it fits this, uh, mold a little better, okay? And now I can say the product 1200 times 2520 is equal to 2 to the 7 times 3 to the 3 times 5 cubed times 7 to the 1. Okay, and that's just a direct application of my exponent laws. Any questions with that? Okay, and so now we'll transition into the idea of greatest common divisor. Okay, so the greatest common divisor of two numbers, AB, denoted by GCDAB, um, is the largest D such that D divides A and D divides B. Okay? And so in previous classes, what you probably did was, okay, let's find the GCD of 12 and 52. Well, I've got to write all the factors of 12. Right? Divisor and factor are the same thing, so sometimes you'll see GCF instead of GCD. What do we have? We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 12. What are the factors of 52? Well, we have 1, 2, 4, 6, and so on and so forth. I think you get a 20, uh, 13 in there, uh, 26, right? That doesn't sound right. There should not be a 6 there. Whatever, you get the idea. And what you have to do is essentially just write out all the factors and look at the largest one that's in both lists. Okay? And if you're bad at arithmetic like me, you'll just make mistakes and, you know, uh, nobody has time for this, right? Like, what if I gave you, find the GCD of 1200 and 2520, like the numbers on the previous slide? What would you do then? Right? There's, there's, there has to be a more efficient way, and so there is. Okay? So again, let's consider 1200 and 2520. Okay, and what we want to look at is their prime factorization. So why don't I just copy this from the previous slide? Okay, so I have their prime factorizations. And I want to find the greatest common divisor of the two. Okay, so I'll give you a couple minutes. Try and figure out how you can leverage the prime factorization, which we already know, um, to determine the greatest common factor. I'll give you a hint. is equal to 2 to the something times 3 to the something times 5 to the something times 7 to the something. Okay? So I'll give you a couple minutes. Discuss amongst yourselves. Try and determine how you find what the greatest common uh, divisor between these two would be.
Okay. What are the exponents and how do you determine them? Any idea? Yeah. You take like the lower one of the powers that are shared between uh, the two numbers, high factorization. Okay. So you're saying, um, like for example, here in, of four and three, we take three. Of one and two, we take one. Of five, of uh, two and one, we take one. And of zero and one, we take zero. Okay, that's right. But why? Yeah. So you're on the right track. What we want to do is find, the, essentially, the biggest number that divides both of them. Okay? And so what we can do is look at 2 to the something, 3 to the something, 5 to the something, and 7 to the something independently. Okay? Um, because, you know, having more or less 2 is one impact the number of 3s you have. Okay? So why don't we look at this in four separate cases? Okay? So we need to find the number of 2s to select. Okay? Well, I want the biggest number of 2s that will divide both 2 to the 3 and 2 to the 4. Is that clear? And so I want the biggest number um, that is less than or equal to 3 and 4. And what is that number? 3. Is that clear? Right, because if I pick 4, then 2 to the 4 does not divide 2 to the 3. Right, so then our number would be too big. It would have too many 2s. So what we need to do is select um, the, uh, the smaller of the two because the smaller of the two will divide both. Right? Two to the three divides two to the three and two to the three divides two to the four. Is that clear? Right? Two to the min three four divides two to the three and two to the min three four will divide two to the four. Okay, so I take two to the three. Similarly, I can choose 3 to the 1 or 3 to the 2, but I want the biggest one that will divide both. Okay, And the biggest power of 3 that will divide both 3 to the 1 and 3 to the 2 will be 3 to the 1. Okay, And similarly, I can fill all of this out, um, and I get 7 to the 0, and I believe you get 8 times 15, which is 120. Okay, So notice, this is significantly better than, you know, going through and writing, like manually enumerating through all of the factors. Okay, you can just look at the prime factorizations, take the minimums of the exponents, and multiply them all. Okay, so in general, what we can say is if we have two numbers written in their canonical form, okay, and one thing you might be thinking of, although there's not a direct relationship, is how these prime numbers and exponents can be thought of as like um, basis vectors for all the natural numbers. Okay, that's one parallel you might make. Um, so we have A written as a product of P1 through PK with the exponents C1 through CK and P just uses exponents D1 through DK. The GCD of A and B is again a product of P1 through PK but the exponents are now the minimums of the, the pairs from before. Okay, and this is a direct application of what we just saw here. Take, okay, for each base we take the smaller of the two. So any questions with that? Okay, and um, when the GCD of two numbers is one, we say that they're relatively prime or co-prime to one another, which means they share no factors. Okay, it doesn't mean that individually A and B are both prime though, right? Like for example, 12 and, uh, I don't know, whatever, you can easily think of numbers that are co-prime, like 25 and 36 for example. Neither of them are prime, but they're co-prime to one another because their GCD is one. So is everyone okay with this formula for the GCD? Okay, and what we're about to do in a minute is figure out a similar formula for the lowest common multiple. Okay, and what you can probably guess is that instead of having the mins in the exponents, we'll have the max. Okay, and we'll look at that in just a second. But um, here's an interesting theorem that we'll need to use a lot when we get to modular arithmetic. Okay? So if we're looking at any two natural numbers, A and B, there exists, not necessarily unique, but there exists um, integers U and V, so potentially negative. 
such that I can say A times U plus V times B is equal to the greatest common divisor of A and B. Okay? In other words, um, I can always write a linear combination of A and B such that it adds up to their greatest common divisor. Right? This is a linear combination of A and B. Is that clear? Okay? And again, we're not saying that U and V are unique. Okay, so for example, why don't we consider A is 5 and B is 13. What's the GCD of 5 and 13? One, right? They're both prime. Okay, if they're both prime, the GCD is always one, but not the converse, right? And so what this is saying is that there exists some u and v such that I can say 5 times u plus 13 times v is equal to 1. Okay? So 1 such um, u and v could be 5 times negative 5 oops, plus 13 times 2. That gives me one, right? Negative 25 plus 26. Can you think of another one? One where u is positive and v is negative. Okay. We could have 5 times something plus 13 times something else will give me one. 13 times negative 3, and 5 times 8. Good. Right. An interesting thing you might note, this increased by 13 while this dropped by 5. Okay? And so, I can, like, they're, it turns out they're not unique. I can actually do this uh, infinitely many ways. Okay? And the case where the GCD of two numbers is one, will be the one that we look at um, extensively when talking about modular arithmetic. Okay? So oftentimes we'll be faced with this problem, here are two numbers, find a linear combination of them that um, adds up to one. Is that clear? Okay? And, um, you know, right off the bat, we won't talk much about this until Thursday, but what these equations tell you is that eight is the inverse of 5 modulo 13, and that 2 is the inverse of 13 modulo 5. Okay, what exactly does that mean? We don't need to talk about it just yet, but that's sort of like where we're heading. Okay, um, but notice, it works for any um, A and B, right? Like, so A and B did not have to be co-prime. In this case, they were co-prime, right? But they don't always have to be. And you could also find the equations for that. So any questions with this? Okay, and so another thing you might be wondering is, here we just looked at it and figured out, we guessed that it would be 8 and negative 3 or negative 5 and 2. Is there like a surefire way that no matter what, I can get these coefficients? And it turns out there is, okay? And we're about to look at uh, the beginning of it on the next slide. We'll probably only finish it uh, next Tuesday, okay? One thing I should have pointed out, though, is that if P is prime, the GCD of A and P is 1 where when A is not a multiple of P. Is that clear? So if A is any um, natural number that's not a multiple of P, the GCD of A and P will be 1 if P is prime. Is that clear? Right? Because if it's prime, it won't share any factors with any other number that's not a multiple of it. And so, one thing you might be thinking is that if a and p are, um, if p is prime and a is any other number, I can always write um, a times something plus p times something else is equal to one. Okay, and that will be extremely important um, starting um, Thursday as well. If the GCD of a and p is one, I can always write a times something plus t p times something else is equal to one. Okay, cool. And so, 
Um, this is something, wait, raise your hands if you've seen this in 61A, potentially. Okay. Um, maybe if you go to the extra lecture series or something like that. Um, but, okay. So this is another way to compute the greatest common divisor um, of two numbers. Okay. And you do it recursively. And this way it assumes that A is greater than B. And essentially what we repeatedly do is say the GCD of A and B is equal to the GCD of B and the remainder when you divide um, A by B. Okay, so we won't look at the proof of this, but this will be very important when it comes to finding these coefficients um, to add up to 1 or to add up to GCD A and B. Okay? And so um, first what we'll do is write out like almost like a stack trace of what would happen if we plug in two values for A and B and look at the cause we would look at. Okay, so why don't we use the example from the previous slide. We want to look at the GCD of 13 and 5. What would the next call be? Well, I change A comma B to B comma A mod B. So this comes over here. So I'm left with 5 comma 13 mod 5, which is the remainder when you divide 13 by 5, which is what? 3, right? You can do this again. Replace this with a 3. What's the remainder when you divide 5 by 3? Sounds like 2. What's the remainder when you divide 3 by 2? You get 1. And then now I have 1 comma 0. Oh, look, B is equal to 0, so I return A. Therefore, the GCD of 13 and 5 is equal to 1. Is that clear? Okay. And so what we'll start looking at is how can I leverage this to come up with these coefficients U and V? Okay. And um, I'll, we can, I'll, I'll mention it a little bit now. Essentially, what we will do at each stage is use the division algorithm to write a relationship between A and B. Okay, and so that's why the division algorithm is important. Okay, so what we'll do here is say 13 is equal to 5 times something plus a remainder. 5 is equal to 3 times something plus a remainder. And notice the remainders match up, right? I can say... Um, 3 is equal to 2 times something plus the remainder, and so on and so forth. And what I can actually do is do, like, do some substitutions upwards, and the result will end up giving me 1 is equal to 5 times something plus 13 times something. Okay? Um, don't worry too much about that calculation now. We will walk through several examples you know, next week um, and on Thursday. That's just sort of giving you a taste of where we're heading. Okay? And this calculation will be extremely important when you take um, future courses. Okay, so this is something you might want to learn how to do at this stage. But again, we'll only start talking about this on Thursday. Okay, the last thing we really need for today is the idea of the lowest common multiple. Okay, and so notice before, the greatest common um, factor, or the greatest common divisor, we took the min in each exponent, right? Because we wanted the biggest number that would divide both of them. Okay, now we, what we want is the smallest number that is a multiple of both, right? And so, again, why don't we consider 1,200, oops, which is 2 to the 4, 3, 5 squared times 7 to the 0, and 2520, which is 2 cubed times 3 squared, 5 to the 1, 7 to the, Z, uh, 7 to the 1. What we want is to pick a number for each of these, 2, 3, 5, and 7, that is a multiple of both of them, right? And so we notice 2 to the 4 is a multiple of both 2 to the 3 and 2 to the 4. 3 squared is a multiple of both 3 to the 1 and 3 to the 2 and so on and so forth. So for the greatest common factor, we took the min in the exponent because we needed it to be smaller than both. Um, but the lowest common multiple we take the max of the exponent because it needs to be um, greater than or equal to both. Okay? So for example, the GCD of 122520, which we saw before, 
would be 2 to the 3 times 3 to the 1 times uh, 5 to the 1 times 7 to the 0. But the lowest common multiple, the exponents would be reversed. So instead of 2 to the 3, we'd have 2 to the 4. Instead of 3 to the 1, we have 3 to the 2, and so on and so forth. And we get this product. So any questions with the lowest common multiple? Usually the greatest common uh, factor, the greatest common divisor, is the significantly more important one. But um, this definition is also important. Okay, so now here's probably the thing we'll end on today. We want to prove that A times B is equal to the product of the LCM of A and B and the GCD of A and B. Okay? And if you, like, once we have this proof, one of the questions on the homework um, becomes very... Uh, trivial essentially okay one of the questions on the homework is prove that the lcm is equal to a times b if and only if the gcd is equal to one well if you set the gcd equal to one here that's essentially the answer to the question right but you need to have this proof first and so we, we can walk through that now so i'll give you let's say a minute um to discuss this amongst your peers and then we'll take it up Okay, and so this whole proof just relies around the fact that the max of, let's just say, x and y plus the min of x and y is just equal to x plus y. Is that clear? Right? Like, you can, if you really wanted to, you could break this up into three cases, one where x is greater than y, one where they're equal, and one where x is less than y. But in all three cases, you'd see that one of them will be equal to the max and the other will be equal to the min. Except for the case where they're both the same, but x plus y would just be 2x in that case. Right? And so that's really all you need for this proof. Right? Because we have the LCM of AB, which is P1 to the max of, what did we say they were here? C1 and D1. P2 to the max, C2, D2. PK, the max, CK, DK, the GCD looks very similar. Place all the maxes with mins. And you get the product is just P1 to the max of C1, D1 plus min of C1, D1, which is just C1 plus D1. P2 to this quantity plus this quantity, but as we showed before, that would just be C2 plus D2 dot 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 PK to the CK plus DK. Okay? And does that look like the representation of A times B? I think so. Where do we go? Right here. Right, we just said when you multiply the two numbers, you just add the exponents. That's exactly what we're doing. So any questions with that? 